Welcome to the Simply Smart Business Show with me, Gemma Went. Now on this show, I like to share simple, smart strategies that have helped me to create the success I have in my business and helped my clients to create success in theirs. We cover mindset, strategy, and how to take inspired action to get you to the results that you crave. Now, if that sounds good, I would love you to subscribe and even better, leave me a review and let me know what you think about it. But for now, let's crack on with the show. And welcome to another of our seven figure female series where I am delighted to bring Sigrun to you. Sigrun is on a mission to accelerate gender equality through female entrepreneurship. She is the leading business mentor for female online entrepreneurs in Europe, TEDx speaker, and a host of the Sigrun Show podcast. Sigrun, welcome. Thank you for having me. I'm honored, Gemma. Oh, I'm so happy to have you here. I'm so, I'm really looking forward to getting into this conversation with you because I followed your journey and from a long time, actually, and it's been so inspiring. So it's going to be fun getting into the nitty gritty with you today. So, um, First question, when did you hit seven figures in your business? It was my fourth year in business. And uh, it was interesting. I had bought a perfume. I was was going through duty-free two years earlier. So starting my third year in business, I'm going through duty-free in January on the way to a mastermind retreat. And I see this perfume, million dollars. Uh, and I bought it. Actually, I bought two. I bought one for me and one for my business coach because I knew she was also not at uh, seven figures yet. And I said, this is for us to visualize I you know, our uh, upcoming million dollar year. It turned out this was a perfume for men and not for women. <laughs> <laughs> so I never used it, uh, but I do have it on my desk. Oh, I love today. that. And I kept it in the box until I made it. So it was just on my table. And then, yeah, uh, two years later, two years after buying it, uh, I made it. And it was interesting because I wrote an email in February that year to my audience. This is the year I'm going to make a million dollars. I had Mm. made 340,000 the year before. So I know it was like a aggressive goal, triple my income, but it was like, I wanted to kind of I wanted to commit to it and I wanted to share it with my audience. And they were like, yay, you're going to do it. You're going to do it. I love that. And then by August, I was only at 340,000 like the year before. So I was starting to think, oh, I will not make it. And, you know, I don't mind sharing a goal with my audience and not not making it. I'm going to be honest with you. That's the reality, uh, right? That's sometimes we do. Yeah. 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 But I was like, I, I, I need to do it. I need to do it because I've told everyone uh, I will do it. But what happened was I launched my podcast, 2nd of August. I did my first uh, live event with 90 people in September. Uh, I launched like three mas- two or three mastermind groups or something. And on 31st of December, 2017, I hit the million dollars just before midnight. Oh, my God. Gosh, that is an amazing story. I love that. So what, that's two years ago? Yes. Amazing. Oh, congratulations. What a fantastic story. There are so many lessons in there for people, right? So many lessons about not giving up, sharing your goals, that kind of accountability once you've shared it with other people. I love that. I love that. Um, so how was your 2019 then? What were your figures for 2019? So 2018 is 1.5 million. I had the idea I could just double my million, but that is a little bit harder. (laughs) I have to admit. So, but, uh, last year, uh, 2019, it was 2.2. So it has still been an aggressive growth. And we do have some growth pains, to be honest. Like, Mm -hmm. you know, building out the team, I had a lot of resistance. Uh, I used to, I was a CEO for 10 years before I started this Mm -hmm. business. I was actually a turnaround CEO, uh, you know, fixing distressed companies. And I got used to firing people and hiring people. And 
I don't know, I had a huge resistance in my own business to build a larger team. Mm. And I was trying to go on with super small team. And I just like, I'm not going to be able to do everything that I want to do. And, and I'm getting a little bit tired. I honestly got a bit tired. I think 2000, end of 2018, a part of 2019, I was quite tired because mm. I was resisting hiring more people. You know, my company could obviously afford it, but there was some resistance. And in one mastermind retreat I attended, uh, one woman who doesn't speak up very often, she's a little bit older, 10, 15 years older than me, she said, Sigrun, can it be that you are just trying to prove to all women that you can do it all on your own? Oh, wow. And I was like, oh, maybe that's it. Oh, wow. So what happened after that? I went on a hiring spree. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I don't know. I think I tripled, uh, you know, uh, some are employees, some are contractors, depends. I'm mean, based in Switzerland. Yeah. I prefer not to hire in Switzerland uh, because of the salaries here being so high. Mm. Uh, but my, my, my uh, employees and contractors are all over the place. And uh, we are about 15 people on my team uh, and then some additional contractors. Mm. But yeah, that, there was this crazy resistance to, to uh, getting more people on board. And it changes a lot because you go from actually be an entrepreneur to see you. And I yeah. think a lot of people don't realize this. That's what, how big that shift is. It's yeah. so easy to just say, oh, can you do this for me? Can you do this for me? Can you do this for me? And suddenly you have a company and you have to have management roles and you have to tell them what they should do for you or what the vision of the company is. And, and then, then you have to leave them to manage it and not not get involved. <laughs> I know. And, and the funny thing is, I, I used to do this, you know, yeah. 10 years ago, I, I used to do this. And I'm like, oh, it's so hard to go back and forth. You go yeah. back to being, you know, into every little tiny task. And then you go back up and like, oh, I shouldn't be involved in every little tiny task. But it's also hard when you're a personal brand. And yeah. it matters what you put out, the copy, the images, the videos, it, it's not the same as, as just running somebody's company and it doesn't matter if the, the ad looks this way. No, it's your face on there. And also it's your baby, isn't it? There, it? You're so attached to your business when it is a personal brand and when it's your own. It's a different yeah. feeling altogether, completely yeah. different. I love that you shared that. I, do you know what I've had? I've had those kind of um, growing pains as well. And it's, it's interesting, those stories that crop up and you have no idea that they're there. And I have one. And I still think I'm, I'm fighting this one around get, growing my business bigger, making more money means that I will burn out. And I have this absolute belief that it will absolutely happen. And I've I'm sort of been navigating that over the, over the last year. But these things crop up as we grow, right? Yeah. But what I found is actually it's easier to have a bigger business. Yes, you have more responsibility and you realize it's in time of crisis, your responsibility towards employees and contractors. And you want to keep on growing also that you can afford to keep them if something, yeah. you know, happens. But Honestly, it is easier when you don't have to do every little detail and yeah. things that you're not even that good at yeah. and you have others who are better at it. And uh, I think it was the shift of, you know, going to six figures, that was a milestone, but the, the million dollars were, it was such a, I think it was an emotional milestone more than mm. financial. Mm. It was some kind of like, Hey, I, I did it. I made it. I, I yeah. have shown women that they can do it too. Yeah, yeah. And that's you're you're a big lighthouse for that, right? Yeah, that's that's part of a massive part of your brand, showing women what they can do. So I imagine that that was a huge milestone for you. Um, let's go back then to 2019. So what are you selling to create that revenue? What what do your revenue streams look like? So uh, my signature program is Samba, Sigrun's online MBA. Uh, it's a 12th month program. And it was born from the fact that I did, I did 100 webinars first. <laughs> I remember those. <laughs> <laughs> With, you know, and no webinar was the same. So 
hundred different topics. Yeah. And once I had done that, I got very tired of doing all the webinars. I realized I had like a massive library. Mm. So from there, uh, it was actually also in 2017, my million dollar year, mm. where in January I launched Somba. And I had been really like, where is my signature program? Why don't I have one? Uh, and I realized there was gold in my webinars, but I had to put them together differently. I had to actually create modules and worksheets and, you know, make it more digestible and step-by-step mm. process. Uh, so I launched that in 2017, so not, not so old. And then I stopped selling uh, cheaper programs. I mm. had for a while a program called Passionathon, how to find your true passion and the right business idea. I never really gave it the love it needed in terms of launching. So now it's just a bonus. I might bring it back. Who knows? Maybe mm. it's time for it right now to bring mm. it back. But it's a $3,000 program. That's my, you know, that's the only way to kind of start to work with me. And then from there, uh, people join a group coaching program called Momentum, also 12 months. There I have multiple coaches. Uh, there's a call at least once a week with a coach and uh, we are helping women take their business to six figures and ultimately to 200,000 because that prepares them for the next program, which is VIP Mastermind. Uh, and that's more like a mastermind where we have less coaching, but more just facilitating between the group members. And then I started a brand new program in 2020, Red Circle, where I have uh, women who are about to make a million dollars. And actually, we do have also seven figure people. Mm. in that program. And that's super exciting. Lovely. That's a lot to manage. No wonder you need a team. Yeah. <laughs> I have, and then I have the self-made summit, which I've mm. now postponed to next year. So that essentially are five programs. I know it feels like a lot, uh, but yeah, I do have a lot of help. As I said, I have coaches in, mm -hmm. uh, in my group coaching program. Uh, we're about six coaches right now. Uh, and we are basically more coaches than we need to be uh, prepared for more growth. Um, then I have uh, mentors. So these are like students that have been a part of my universe for a while. And initially they volunteered and now I pay them. So I have like 10 of those in my Samba program. Uh, then I have a coach also in Samba to help me kickstart everything the first 10 weeks when they join. Um, you yeah, so basically have a lot of help now, yeah. but people still feel my presence in every program. I yeah. never want to be the person that sells you something and then runs off with your money it and is, yeah. disappears. No. Yeah. I love that. Thank you so much. Um, that's really interesting. Uh, things really shifted for me actually when I started to bring other coaches in. And I think you realize then the possibilities, right? When you realize actually it doesn't have to be all me. There are some amazing people that yeah. can share their stuff, who are better at doing those things than I am. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a really lovely move. So talk to me about how you sell. Are you, because you've talked about launching, are you all in on launching or do you have funnels running as well? Like what does that, your sort of your marketing engine look like? So I launch Samba uh, and we typically launch it twice a year. We actually launched it three times last year, but that was not necessarily better to be really honest. Uh, I think you actually, uh, what do you call when you ruin your own thing? Uh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, the word. Suppose... Uh, yeah. I, I'm looking for that particular yeah. word. I, I can't think of it. <laughs> <I think it's, laughs> we might think, get to it in a minute. Yeah. Uh, so basically, uh, doing more launches, uh, to the audience that is willing to buy your program, it's not necessarily lead to better results. It's actually yeah. less. It's more. Ultimately I will probably move to one launch a year. Yeah. Uh, but uh, I feel quite happy doing two launches a year for Samba. And the people joining the other programs, it's, they have been in Samba already, mm -hmm. most of them. So that's really my funnel. It's just an internal funnel that you don't see from the outside. So yeah. most people will probably not know that I have three other programs because I just externally talk about Samba, Samba, Samba. Yeah. Um, but we do have, uh, you know, through the podcast, through the emails, also we have people joining from the outside. But yeah, we do not have like some fancy funnels to bring people in because mm. we are a, a launch model business. Yeah. But internally, 
there is a, a drive. Like we, we see that people join sometimes a $3,000 program and they're further in business. And I'm like, you're in the wrong program. You should go and join the other one. And that's pretty much our funnel. I love that. That's a really nice structure. It's a really nice structure. Because as well, you know, once, once they move from Samba into Momentum, you've already got a really good relationship. Yeah. You already know those guys. So it's easier taking them to that next level because you know the connection, you have the connection, you know what they need next. So it makes absolute sense. It's just a language, you know, uh, <clears throat> also if they need some help, I was like, yeah, you find that in module five. And, mm. you know, it's like this, it, it makes a lot of things uh, easier. But yeah, we are, are running ads right now to people go directly into momentum because we mm. feel we have the capacity. As I said, I hired coaches like you yeah, experienced yeah. too. There was a resistance to that too. Yeah, you know, yeah. oh, only I can do it. And people are wanting me. And I was, you know, doing so many calls and I was like, oh, getting a little bit exhausted. Mm. Uh, and I started with internal team members. So that felt a little bit easier because we just like had an agreement, you know, and I didn't have to necessarily pay them more. We just shifted some tasks around and then two team members started to coach. And I realized, oh, that's great. And uh, it took me a while until I actually hired external coaches. And I started also with some people that actually had been clients. So I knew them very well. So we haven't actually hired anyone yet that's not been a team member or a previous client as a coach. But just to give people some ideas where you can find yeah. someone, because you think you can't find someone. And I'm like, they are probably right there in front of you and you just don't see it until you suddenly see it. Exactly. I did the same. Most of mine are ex-clients who know my frameworks, know how I work, and I know and trust them. And that really helps with that process. So we've talked about team. I'd love to know what your team actually looks like, the kind of the support admin side operations. What does that look like for you? So my husband joined my team uh, when he lost his job. Uh, he had been working at Cisco Systems and lost his job end of 2016, I remember. Yeah. Uh, so in 2017, he joined and uh, he started actually even before he lost his job. He's like, your email is a mess. You know, he was like looking at my email and said, what is wrong with this? Why are you not replying to these people? Or, or, you know, why haven't you archived old messages that you've read? And it really bothered him. So he had had a personal assistant himself at work. And I had never had one. Even if I was a CEO before, I had never had an executive or personal assistant. So he started helping me with email and calendar even before he officially, you know, quit his other job. Yeah. Uh, and he did that for a while. Also my booking, my travel and everything. Mm. Uh, but eventually I hired finally last year an executive assistant. There was also resistance to that. Yeah. What should I ask this woman to do? <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know... Uh, People around me that have had exact decisions, I said, Sigrun, once you hire the person, you're going to give her so many tasks, you just don't know. And I always find it hard to explain, but she is really very well, uh, you know, she's very busy. So, yeah, so I have executive assistant. Uh, my husband is COO. So now he's not doing those, you know, executive assistant tasks anymore, but he's still kind of watching, making sure my travel is booked correctly. And so he's training the executive assistant. Uh, and, but he does uh, pay our bills. He opens all mail, physical mail that comes. Mm -hmm. Uh, he will, you know, interact with our accountant uh, and, you know, things in the background. He's actually the affiliate manager. So oh. we have affiliates for Samba and he manages that. He used to do channels for Cisco. So I'm like, oh, this is the perfect role for you. Yeah, perfect. <laughs> Leaderboard and having them compete <laughs> and stuff like that. Uh, and then I have... Uh, a uh, launch manager. She's like online business manager slash launch manager. Lynn, she's been a part of my team uh, since May 2015. Oh, wow. Started with like two, three hours a week and now full time since a while. And for, for a long time, it was just me, Lynn and Martin, you know, or even just me and Lynn. Like we were two people uh, running almost a seven figure business. Uh, but then I've hired now, I have a content writer. I have a copywriter. I have a social media manager. 
I have a podcast manager that also does some video editing. And I just recently hired a, a project manager for media only. Mm. Uh, Yeah. So not necessarily project manager for the whole business, but for media, because I want to go all in on just video and media. And actually I've been wanting to do that for a while. I just didn't feel I had the right team or something. And now I realized actually I I need a project manager because it's not enough to hire the people who can do the video editing. Who's going to manage them? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So that's, we've kind of had to, we sometimes are hiring uh, first the people who actually do the work. And then I realized, oh, they need a manager. Uh, or you go the other way around, you hire a manager first and then they can hire some people. So did I mention all the people I have? I don't think so. But yeah, <laughs> yeah. Content writer and copywriter. Yeah, these are two different tasks. Mm. So uh, yeah, Explain that. That's interesting for people. Yeah. So uh, we decided, uh, I, I've done over 360 podcast episodes since I launched my podcast in August 2017. And we hired a show note writer very quickly. So he's based in the U.S., and just takes a fixed fee per episode. But I am a reader myself. Mm. I don't like actually to listen to podcasts or watch mm. videos. Uh, I know it's very popular. And if I go for a walk, yes, I will listen to a podcast. But otherwise, I'm just at home. I, I don't commute, you know. And if I want some content, I want to read it. So we decided some months ago to actually not do the traditional show notes, the summaries, and write a proper blog post. Mm -hmm. So that means once I've uh, recorded a podcast episode, we have it transcribed by Rev. Mm -hmm. Then it goes to the content writer and C writes a blog post. Mm -hmm. So a content writer is not someone that knows how to write copy that sells necessarily, but it's someone who knows how to blog. Yeah. So uh, we are training her to write a little bit, you know, call to action copy, Mm -hmm. maybe not sales emails, but call to action copy and She's doing that. So she's starting to help out with the social media posts and stuff like that. A copywriter is someone that can write a copy that sells, you know, sales pages, landing pages, sales emails. So these are two roles and they are both not full time because for me, essentially it would be ideal if this is one full time employee, but it's just very different uh, capabilities. Mm -hmm. No, I love that distinction. Thank you for sharing that. Um, Okay, so... What do you think, and this is, this is going to take your mind back, but I think this will be really useful for people. What do you think the key differences are in running a business that's at sort of the, the six-figure mark and the seven-figure mark? Because that's a big jump, right? Yeah. I think the six-figure one, it's, it's you and maybe one VA. Mm. So you're pretty much doing everything and you're just, it's task-based, you know? Yeah. And at seven figures, you have to be willing. I know it's challenging (laughs) for all of us. You have to be willing to create a management structure where Mm. you have uh, even more qualified people. You might actually have to get rid of everyone you work with before Mm. and hire new people on your team. But you can also be lucky and someone is willing to grow into that role and actually start to manage people. I think that will be the key differentiator in who you work with. My feeling is that I just do more and more of what I love mm-hmm. and less and less of things that, uh, you know, I don't love. But, you know, I actually love building a t- type form. <laughs> and I, <laughs> you know, so I have, to, I have to sit on my hands if I have an idea. Oh, let's do a type form for that. I, I shouldn't even be thinking that way. Yeah. So I, I, have to, I have to untrain myself basically to kind of like, okay. I have an executive assistant, I have a project manager, I have to just tell them what I want and I can still review it and send them back. And it is this patience of, yeah. of uh, that things go a little bit slower. You feel they go a little bit slower, but yeah. it is for your own benefit. Although now, you know, when you go into a crisis mode, I used to be a turnaround CEO. Mm. So I am like a drill sergeant with my team now. We have daily meetings and I said, I want quick turnarounds. This yeah. is not like, you know, nobody's going to think about that. Da, 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 da. It's just like, quack, quack. If, I, yeah. if I want something done, I want it ready tomorrow. Yeah. That's not how you can operate a business for the long term. Mm. That's only for times of crisis. Yeah, that's really useful. Thank you. So what do you think then have been your, um, your biggest challenges 
as you've grown? And we've obviously spoken about team a lot, but have there been any other challenges that you've struggled with? Ah, money mindset. Mm. Uh, yeah, uh, that that hit me just after my first year. Uh, in my first year, I was like, didn't really know how to make money. Weirdly enough, <laughs> I had been running companies before, but when it's different your own, though, right? When it's your own, yeah, it's it's you. You have this like, oh, oh, can I really ask for this money? And da, 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 yeah. all these thoughts come up. So you you kind of slowly get over it, and. Uh, but I, I had a I had a breakthrough towards the fall of my first year. I hired a business coach for six weeks because mm-hmm. I I had built my list with those weekly webinars like massively. It was so easy back in the days. Facebook ads mm-hmm. were so cheap, and, <laughs> and people were so willing to sign up and attend webinars. Um, but then I was like, oh, I have an email list of fifteen hundred people. Why am I not earning more money? And I'd realized I couldn't deal with. It. I had to hire someone. Uh, now I would have joined a mastermind, but I didn't even know mm-hmm. they, they existed back then. And so within a few weeks, we got over that. Like, hey, you just have to make an offer and then you have to follow up on the offer. I'm like, oh, you have to follow up. Oh, <laughs> It's like all <laughs> these things are <laughs> so <laughs> obvious, but it's not obvious when you are in the middle yeah. of it. And You don't and, know what you don't know, do you, at that point? No. So I made $55,000 in three months towards the end of my first year after making... 20,000 the other nine months. Mm. So that imagine just like the feeling like, who am I to deserve all this yeah. money? Like, where is this coming from? Is this, is this a fluke? Is this just going away? So obviously I made it go away because in January, 2015, uh, I earned $1,700. Oh, wow. After 55,000 in three yeah. months. And it was purely my mindset there were people on my list. I was still doing webinars. I uh, would sometimes not advertise the webinars. I would sometimes not send out emails. I would not follow up with potential leads. It was purely in my head. Mm. And it was like, if you read The Big Leap. Yes, you know, love it. It's like, here are all the good stuff happening for me. Oh, I'm going to have some bad stuff happen for me. So I just made it happen. And that was a shock. That was a huge mm. shock to me. And uh, so I do recognize it moving forward when it happens. Uh, to be honest, with my conference, which, well, I luckily also uh, postponed and everything, but I realized doing something bigger than I had ever done before brings again up the, what I call self-sabotage, really. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So you, so let's say you ask someone to speak at your conference and you're like super happy. They say yes, but then you don't send out the contract to them. You don't tell them what to do so they can help you promote. You know what I mean? It was like yeah, all yeah. sorts. Of, I was doing all, even last year, last yeah. year, this came up. So I think every time you just hit a new, well, a new level, a new devil. Exactly. Exactly. It's uh, yeah, they, they stay, don't they? The thing is, they just, they just manifest in different ways. Um, yeah. And we, we all have them, right? We all have them. Um, what do you have specific sort of daily habits or processes or behaviors that really kind of help you with your focus and your, and, and help you create the success that you have? I don't have a morning routine. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. <laughs> everybody, everybody says like, oh, I journal, I meditate. And I'm like, I don't. <laughs> but, but I sleep. I sleep a lot. Like I have no problem sleeping. I, I sleep in. Well, I sleep as much as I need. Mm. I prefer to start my day a little bit later. I'm a, I'm a night owl. So I prefer mm. to start later and work even until 8 p.m. Uh, I'm the same. I'm the same, actually. I'm way better at the other end of the day. I just get more energy. So uh, I, I, I love that. And uh, I really just make sure that the week is structured in a way that I actually have Thursdays and Friday. Not off, but, you know, no meetings. So yeah. I, I really fill my days uh, Monday, Tuesday. Wednesday are my podcast recording days. So daily habit is more like I'm in a gear for this day, like, Today, like Mondays is more internal. We have internal meetings, internal discussions. Tuesdays, more external uh, coaching calls and podcasting on Wednesdays and Thursday and Friday should be kept free. Now, 
because we live in a crazy world, things change. But then I suddenly can have a virtual summit on a Friday or do something else on a Thursday because it wasn't booked up before. Yeah. And I also do not hesitate to actually, I didn't do this in the first years, but now if I'm not feeling like, if I'm feeling tired, it, it happens rarely, but let's say I just feel this, you know, tiredness coming over me for some reason. I will take a nap in the middle of the day mm. and I might say to my team, oh, sorry, I can't make this meeting. Now I'm the one I'm super committed. If there's a meeting, I'll show up no matter what, but I am also willing to say, Hey, I'm not okay. And let's, can we, is it okay to move it around? You know, yeah. I'm really, I listen to my body. So I don't think I need to meditate on journal for that, mm. but I think these are good practices and maybe yeah. one day, one day I'll, I'll finally do it. Uh, but I just take care of my sleep and, make sure I get energy. I love that. Sleep is so important. I'm someone that does suffer from insomnia. So I, I really prioritize sleep and rest. So I love that you've shared that. Um, is there anything that you have, have really committed to being consistent in, in your business to really help you to support yourself and to grow and, and whatever else? Yeah. So <laughs> In the beginning, I tried to blog, uh, mm. so that didn't work so well. Uh, I actually love to write when I get into it, but I find it very hard to sit down and do it. Uh, the webinars was a way for me because I had this idea when I did the Strength Finder test, consistency was low. And oh. I'm, like, I'm like, ooh. Yeah, I think uh, in Myers-Briggs, I'm also a P. Yeah. Uh, so I don't really like structure. I don't mm. like it. I like that my days are all different and I don't like nine to five. I'm just like, you know, and, and, but I will be super committed. Like I did my hundred webinars. Mm. I did them weekly for a long time. The final 20, uh, maybe not weekly anymore. I was getting yeah. tired, <laughs> but now my podcast is out. You know, I did hundred episodes in hundred days. Then I did three a week. Uh, then we went down to two and now we did we do one mm. actually, but it gives me the flexibility to bring up. I say, okay, I want to go back up to, you know, two a week mm. or three a week. And my podcast is out like clockwork. Mm. Now that's got not like, you know, it's, it's not a financial result, but it's still this discipline of we're going to make it happen no mm. matter what. Yeah. And I look at my numbers every uh, Monday. I don't look at them daily. I know what's happening. Uh, but yeah, Monday, I look at all numbers and, mm. you know, we have a scorecard with the team and, you know, and it's also in, in times like these where you have the opportunity to reinforce, like, you know, re remind everyone what really matters and what we should be looking at. Because yeah. obviously, if a business is not making money, uh, it isn't the business and you have to let people go and you don't want to do that. So uh, I think... Yeah, podcast is great on that discipline, but ultimately, you know, cash is the fuel of any company. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So I um I don't believe in mistakes. I think we only have learning opportunities, but I would love to understand what have been your kind of biggest mistakes and learnings over the years. I have to tell you a funny one. <laughs> uh, so talking about like what you're doing when you run a six figure or a or low multiple six figure business, very little staff, you or you're still sending out the emails yourself. Although I might still do it today if I need mm. to get it quickly out and I don't want to wake anyone up or don't want to wait for anyone. Uh, but typically I don't do it today. So I am uh, flying to Iceland and uh, through Copenhagen and somehow the plane uh, you know, get a technical failure and we have to stay overnight in Copenhagen with the whole family on the way to Christmas holiday. And I was planning to kind of like, oh, I'm going to go when I'm in Iceland, I'm going to finish this email. I'm going to send it out. Now I suddenly had to do it, you know, in my hotel room. But, you know, with the family, we wanted to go out and look at some shops and restaurants. and da, da, da. So I'm, I'm like in a hurry in the morning, writing the email and then I send it out. We walk over to a train station to take us into the city and I pick up my phone and I'm like, what? 
I sent out an email. Uh, you know, it was an on report where there was a drop down, yeah. and somehow you picked the email, or you know, so I picked the wrong email. Oh. So, so instead of the email I want that I had written and wanted to send out, it said. Your credit card failed. Please update <laughs> your credit card information. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> and I sent it to the whole list. <laughs> oh, my goodness. That's hilarious. What were the responses? Oh, my God. There were anything from horrible, like, you know, I don't take my money. So people didn't realize also the non-clients that the, I didn't even have their credit card yeah, details. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but they were furious, uh, but to to very understanding, like, I think this is a mistake or, you know, <laughs> <laughs> oh, and then I'm on my phone in Entreport. I'm using Infusionsoft now, but I, I guess it's the same thing. These are not mobile friendly. No, apps. and that's hard on a phone. So we were already in the city. I'm on my phone and, you, you know, when you have a drop down in a browser it, and it doesn't pick, it doesn't pick, you, you move with the mouse or with the <laughs> finger up. And, and it, it was so much work. You know, one thing was to write the email. Like, you know, I could quickly type up like, sorry, mistake. Uh, this was the wrong email. Da, 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 da. Please forgive me. Uh, but sending it out was so hard of, because of the way the, the, the software is set up. Oh my God, that day, like I was just sweating and, uh, you know, and, Half the day was ruined. Yeah, that was not a relaxing stopover. <laughs> oh, no, it wasn't. Because uh, on one hand, I was trying desperately to get out a second email. But then in my help desk, you know, and this was probably on a Friday or a Saturday. You know, I don't think my team was awake. They're oh mostly, you know, gosh. they are in um, uh, East time zone. Oh, my God, this was. But now I can laugh about it. <laughs> Oh my gosh. Thank you for sharing that. That's hilarious. But I can imagine how that felt at the time, that, that moment when you realize and your stomach flips. <laughs> okay. So I've <laughs> got two more things I would love to ask you. Um, what's one thing you know now that you wished you'd known sooner? I think I should have gotten help right mm -hmm. away. Um, I was thinking, oh, I've been a CEO before. I have a master's degree, you know, MBA. Um, I know how this works. And then I struggled for many months. Like it took me nine months to actually get some outside help. Mm -hmm. Now I had bought some online courses, but it, it wasn't, I think most of us still need to be in a program or mastermind or, or yeah. at least at least where you can ask a question. And I wasn't in a program where we could ask a question anymore because the six weeks or eight weeks were over. Mm. Um, so, yeah, getting help and uh, this resistance to hiring people later on, like, oh, my God, like, I, I think I lost. Maybe you can't say you lost because, you know, my business was still growing. Yeah. But I think, you know what the worst thing that can happen to us is that we just burn out because we have yeah. a lot of fun running our businesses. But if we have resistance to getting help, whether it's professional help in order to pick the right strategy or work on our mindset or, you know, hiring employees or contractors, I think these are the things where I wish I would have paid more attention to mm. earlier in my business. Uh, mm. I'm definitely paying attention to the now. I actually do have a mindset coach. Mm. Um, and uh, that was something I thought, oh, why do I need that? <laughs> uh, but I do think as you move along, uh, being in a mastermind is one thing. I love masterminds and mm. I, I, you know, tell everyone to be in one. But I think uh, one mastermind will not give you everything. So you might yeah. have to hire additional professional help. Maybe it's someone that helps you with your finances. Maybe it's someone that helps you with your mindset. So it, it's, it's, it's not having a resistance also to actually just get help ask for help. And some of that help doesn't have to be paid. It could be, mm. you know, people around you that can help you, but yeah, you want professional help. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Couldn't agree more. Um, all right. My final question for you, I would love you to leave a piece of advice for my listeners who do most, I, I work with both men and women, but they are mostly women who are around the sort of pre and 
post six figure mark, I would love you to leave a piece of advice for them. I think I just have to repeat hire, hire help. And uh, I, I remember around that time, I was working with two junior people mm. and I was having to, you know, train too much, uh, figure things out on my own before I taught them how to do it instead of having someone can actually figure things out. Mm. So you have to hire also people for attitude mm. and not skills. Uh, Lynn, who's been on my team since 2015, she knew nothing about Infusionsoft, for instance. She was an mm. entreport. I hired her because she knew entreport. Mm. But I, I figured out later on, it's her attitude that matters. Whatever it is, whatever, it doesn't have to be technical, but also strategic. She is actually today the brand police in the company. Mm. So she said, this is not on brand. This is not going out. We're not accepting this. And I'm like, oh, are we not? Uh, <laughs> it's having people with you that have the right attitudes and you yeah. can totally hire them before you hit the six figures or right afterwards, because that's exactly when Lynn, the longest, uh, you know, my longest employee joined my team. Mm. And then together we went to seven figures. Yeah. I love that story. Thank you so much, Sigrun. It's been an amazing conversation. Thank you so much for having me. It's been an honor. Thank you for listening to the show. If you liked that and you'd like more, please come on over and join my free Facebook group just by searching for Simply Smart Business in Facebook. You'll find it. Come on in. We have stuff like this every single day. But for now, I'll see you in the next episode.